you. Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the session. Um, my name is Karen Kirchnock. I'm the program manager for 2030 Water Resources Group in the World Bank Water Global Practice. Um, welcome to this World Economic Forum Sustainable Development Impact Affiliate Session, which is around restarting economies and building resilience, with a big focus on how to use SDG 17 to do that. Um, I just a few housekeeping rules. Um, you have been muted, um, so please unmute when you're speaking. Um, it will the session will be recorded, so we'll be able to share that afterwards. Um, please feel free to use the chat window to put in your questions. Um, we have team members who will be monitoring the questions and we'll be um, using those when we have the questions and answer session, um, but we'll be monitoring that throughout. So please, please share that. I'm really honored to have welcome Jane Nelson. Um, Jane is the director of the Harvard Kennedy School of Corporate Social Responsibility Initiative at Harvard University. Um, Jane is, has known 2030 Water Resources Group from some, for some time and so has the benefit of being able to see um, at country level, at the global level. And we really, really appreciate Jane here working as a moderator because it is hard work to be a moderator, certainly in this virtual world um, that we're in. So welcome everybody. I'm going to turn it over to Jane and Jane will take us through the program um, for the next hour and a half. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you, Karen. And um, hello, everyone. I'd like to add a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us today from around the world for this very important um, discussion and, and leadership challenge that we share on how can we work most effectively together to ensure that water is made a high priority in all the actions that are being taken to both restart economies and build resilience and ensure ongoing humanitarian response um, in response to the, you know, the devastating um, impacts uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic on people's lives and on people's livelihoods. And throughout the um, time we have together today, I hope there's sort of three key um, goals that we can um, uh, you know, keep, uh, uh, keep in common. First, um, how can we work together to make a strong evidence-based case for water, first as a public health priority, second as an environmental priority, and third as an economic growth priority. And how can we break down the silos between those? Because I think, you know, traditionally water has been seen as an environmental issue. Obviously, the pandemic has clearly demonstrated an important global and public health issue. And great work has been done by the World Bank and McKinsey and others show it as a very important economic growth issue. So that's sort of the first, I think, priority. How can we make the strong, integrated case for water to be a priority um, in stimulus recovery packages and, and moving forward? Secondly, how can we make sure that we keep focused on country ownership and the, established of the establishment of locally led multi-stakeholder alliances that can drive policy change and implementation at the operational country level in a way that's both inclusive and transparent, efficient and, and scalable. And so that importance of that country led, locally led um, sort of leadership agenda. And then thirdly, what are the opportunities to work together in a pre-competitive way to transform value chains? And whether it's, you know, food value chains, you know, manufacturing value chains, mining value chains, how can we work across value chains with sort of water as a key element at, at every stage of the value chain? So those, I think, are sort of three, um, you know, sort of key themes that I hope will, um, you know, come up, you know, throughout the, um, throughout the conversation. And I hope we can keep it very practical and solutions oriented. Um, 2030 Water Resources Group has um, you know, already established multi-stakeholder alliances in, in 14 countries and states. And now as um, you know, part of the, um, the, 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 um, the World Bank's water global practice, I think just an enormous opportunity to replicate, scale and expand as part of the sort of the 10 year um, uh, you know, agenda for, for, for action on, um, on, on the sustainable development goals. In terms of how we're going to structure today, we're going to um, manage it in four parts. First of all, we're going to have a session to set the scene um, and to emphasize water 
as a priority, and also SDG 17 um, on partnerships as a priority. We'll then move from the scene setting session into some country focused discussions. Um, the first round of discussion on how water is being integrated by companies into economic recovery and, and, and sort of restart efforts. And then secondly, looking at how water is being integrated on a, on a, on a policy transformation um, uh, perspective. Then thirdly, we'll have a focus on value chains and how we can um, work across value chains. And then finally finish with a, a, a call to action and some priorities going forward from our chairs of the 2013 resources group. So that's our plan for action. Um, we're thrilled to have various people joining us from around the world. And as always with the virtual world, um, if you have questions, can you put them in the chat box or send an email to one of the team at the, at the World Bank? And I'll try and bring in some of those questions. If we don't cover everything, we're very keen to sort of follow up with people afterwards. So please, you know, if you've got points you want to make or questions, um, you know, put them either in the chat box or uh, continue to follow up as, as we go forward. So that's the plan for today. And I am very excited. We could not have a, a better group of, um, of uh, speakers and panelists to, um, you know, to share their views with us um, you know, across the spectrum from international policy making to national policy making to companies to civil society organizations to farmers and farmer organizations. So without further ado, I'd like to get going and setting the scene and um, introduce Mare Pangestu, who is the managing director for development policy um, and partnerships at the World Bank Group. And Mari, if you can give us some overall scene setting perspectives, that would be excellent. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Jane. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we hope to inspire you today with examples of collective and innovative actions in the water space taken by all the stakeholders in this space, government leaders, CEOs, business leaders, as well as civil society representatives. Uh, the issue of water is actually uh, very much uh, in the forefront uh, as it plays a central role in the combating of uh, COVID-19. While we wait for vaccines and effective treatment, wearing masks and hand washing thoroughly and frequently is our first line of defense. So I think we, we see up close how urgent uh, the issue of water is. But whilst we wait for that, uh, whilst this sounds straightforward, uh, that is washing hands, it is not so for the 3 billion people or 38% of the world's population who don't have access to water. Two out of five healthcare facilities across the developing world do not have provisions for hand washing. That is why water and sanitation facilities have been key components of the World Bank's emergency response. And uh, water and sanitation continue to be central in the forthcoming uh, $160 billion financing uh, in the next phase of response. Uh, I think Jane mentioned uh, how we can take opportunities uh, in, in stimulus programs uh, going forward to address the water and sanitation issue. And that's definitely one of our priorities. Even before the pandemic, we know that climate change, growing populations, pollution and overconsumption were making water an incredibly uh, scarce resource. And we know that water is the linchpin in development, central to building resilience, and that the fact that half of the world's cities are already experiencing water shortages on a recurring basis. And we know that water will be central to a resilient re recovery moving forward. It flows through nearly all uh, sustainable development goals so that ensuring water sec security is an urgent development imperative. And to your point, Jane, about evidence-based uh, water is also affecting economic growth, health, uh, and um, and many other things. I, I always remember this because this has happened in my own country. Water and sanitation are the second and third uh, largest causes of stunting in children, which has an irre irreversible impact on cognitive ability, human capital growth, productivity, and so on. So I think that's just a, a concrete example um, that we face. In tackling the current uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we, all, we are all talking about international cooperation and partnerships, and it's assumed a new level of importance because the demands are truly st staggering. So partnerships or SDG 17 is also true in the way we must address uh, the water issue or the water crisis, if you like to call it. And together, I understand this group has done a lot 
uh, and it has proven that multi multi stakeholder approach uh, with strategic collaboration between public, private, and civil society actors are really very important. And I've been given some examples of uh, how the WRG platform has demonstrated impacts by leveraging nearly 1 billion in additional financing for water security outcomes, impacting water savings uh, of over 660 million cubic meters. I don't know whether that was, uh, we were chatting before about some of the companies that have uh, gone from the use of uh, six liters to one to two liters of water in making their beverages, promoting policy innovations such as water pollution fees and wastewater reuse, reuse laws, and many examples of private sector innovations. So the good news is that business and government leaders are increasingly priorita prioritizing water as a risk and joining forces to respond to system-wide shared priorities. You will hear examples of this from the speakers today. And despite competitive instincts, stakeholders are changing the way they operate through trust and dialogue. And I, I'm assuming that businesses are also finding win-win solutions uh, to and answers uh, to, to, the, to the issue. But we need to do more. Our challenge is to make sure that our efforts are replicated, scaled up, and accelerated. And to do this effectively, we need to focus on, firstly, having greater cross-sectoral uh, co collaboration for cohesive solutions to the water challenge. So I think this platform can play a very important role to further break down the silos and uh, finding the interconnection of issues. And we really hope that more partners can join hands in this initiative. And secondly, we need to innovate at scale to support the achievement of SDGs across many priorities, whether it's agriculture, industrial growth, or urban development. So we hope that we can really uh, push forward uh, on this agenda. And I truly uh, hope that and believe that the World Bank's group, group's ability to work with clients and partners on innovative approaches can help speed up the progress in fighting the pandemic and trans transforming this crisis into uh, an opportunity. And in the case uh, of the water issue, Obviously, we are working a lot on the water and sanitation issue across uh, across many fronts. Uh, one of the issue coming up for, uh, uh, is uh, safe, uh, safely going back to school. You really need hand washing facilities there, and we need, but we need to do it holistically across uh, sectors, institutions, and private sector engagement. Let's commit to partnering differently so that we can speed up progress towards achieving the SGD, SDGs for our future and that of generations to come. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing uh, all the innovations that, that all of you have been doing. Thank you. Jane, you're muted, sorry. <laughs> I'm not muted on my... Okay, now we can hear you. <laughs> okay, I, I wasn't muted. No, okay, so, um, so Mari, I just wanted to um, yeah, thank you for the, the, the bank support. And I think, um, you know, sort of two, uh, you know, sort of key themes that, that, that come out of that, um, you know, the, the very important role that the World Bank Group can play on sort of rigorous data analysis. And can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah we can hear you fine. So on, on, on rigorous um, sort of data analysis and, and both the health data as well as the economic data and the environmental data and this, you know, this message of water is our first line of defense and, and as you know, a, a good example of PPE um, is, is, a, is a key one. And then on the innovation front, and I'll move now to our, um, our colleague Tony Milliken at a, um, ABN and Bev, it seems to me we've got sort of three pillars of innovation that we need to coordinate. There's policy innovation, there's financing innovation, and then thirdly, at the company level, there's both technology and business model innovation, um, which will you know, get us to, to where we need to get. And um, so, Tony, a good um, uh, opportunity then to hand over to you. Tony is the um, um, Chief of Sustainability, Procurement and Circular Ventures Office um, at, at AB um, InBev one of the world's um, beverage companies. Tony, over to you. Wow, Jane, thank you for the introduction. Um, you, you've, you've put a lot of pressure on me with that introduction, but uh, let's, let's talk about uh, water and, and the importance to AB InBev. I mean, just be very specific. Uh, there's many people within our board and, and management that will uh, say no water, no beer. 
Uh, and let me just repeat that. No water, no beer. Water is our, our most precious resource uh, for the company. Uh, we know we can make beer with uh, other ingredients, but there's no way we do it without water. And, and as was mentioned a little earlier, uh, when I joined the company 12 years ago, we were north of six liters to make a liter uh, of beer. We're down now just uh, a little lower than three, approaching two and a half uh, liters to make a liter. So we've made some really, really uh, impactful changes in our brewing process. But I would also say that uh, when you look at what's going on inside our brewery walls, uh, that's only about you know 15% of the water that's consumed. So we've got a lot of work to do outside the walls, specifically around agriculture. But uh, I just want to keep on moving through this topic because it's, it's, I have very little time. So. We have a very um, challenging 2025 water commitment uh, that means we know we can't do it by ourselves. And, and so it takes a strong, strong need of multi-stakeholder partnerships uh, beyond our own operations and projects to achieve the scale and, and deliver impact. And our partnership with the 2030 you know, Water Resources Group um, is a key, key strategic uh, collaboration that helps us contribute to how water resources are managed. So let me just kind of give you some key elements of, of it. So there's, a, there's the combination of just the public sector and our private sector, as you mentioned earlier, Jane. There's a clear analysis of the problem and then using unique strengths of each one of the sectors to help address these problems. So in the private sector, we, we, we know we can't solve it by ourselves. That's why I was saying earlier before we came on uh, this today that, you know, the, there are beverage companies we compete with uh, and, and we can beat our brains out commercially uh, selling our products. But I will say this, the, the common need for us to work across our supply chains and outside together uh, to solve the water is, is a helpfulness for all of us. To, uh, to at least keep us in the game. So um, again, the private sector can't do it by ourselves. We, we, we know uh, they uh, uh, cannot uh, address this water crisis by ourselves and we are raising our game and we can inspire others to do the same. Uh, I'm grateful for Paul's uh, leadership in the world. Uh, I mean, the Water uh, Resource Group. I mean, Paul's the chairman at Nestle's. He's brought together the, the, the titans of the beverage industry together to work together. And without Paul's leadership, uh, we probably wouldn't be here today talking about this. So in final, in, in the last seconds here, I call on each of you to join the, war, uh, the, the Water Resource Group and other partnerships. And this make a difference. And so Jane, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And just very quickly, I want to follow up. Yeah. Um, you know, you talked earlier about being you know, the chief sustainability officer, but you've got 150,000 um, you know, colleagues behind you. Yeah. To share one or two tips with others on the call, you know, how we um, not only set ambitious goals at the top of the company, but sort of embed this throughout companies and through your business part. Yeah. So, so let me, it's going to take more than a couple seconds, but um, about four years ago, uh, Carlos Brito, our CEO and my boss, uh, came to me and he said, hey, Tony, you know, I'd like you to take over sustainability. And, and, and I smiled and he said, you know, Tony, I know you, you're busy. You got a lot on your plate. And I said, no, 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 let me have it. Uh, because the way we look at sustainability is a gift. I mean, given sustainability to the procurement organization, just uh, by title and responsibility was a gift. And, and the reason I say that is because we've got 50,000 suppliers that we can impact. And then instead of just looking at negotiations and, and, and uh, supply security, now we can kind of change another dimension to it to negotiate in green. You know, how, how to have our suppliers do a better job, like our farmers. How do we impact them on how they use technology to lower their water usage? So, so when I was talking to you, Jane, earlier, um, our, our sustainability organization throughout the company with the title sustainability, we're, we're about 25 resources deep, and that includes global and in our zones. We look at the 150,000 colleagues we have, almost every one of those colleagues has a sustainability responsibility. So in our procurement organization, 
everybody's got a sustainability target. And then those things kind of uh, go over into my supply organization. Well, the supply organization and my peer, Pete, uh, Pete Kramer, he's so tied in also because he has targets too. So now all of a sudden half the company already has sustainability top of mind. And then that kind of pushes through. It's, it's interesting when I say 150,000 people uh, actually are, are enthusiastic about sustainability. It's also about engagement. And we, we, we're always surveying our employees about engagement. This has come up as one of the top, top items of, of engagement for our employees. So that's how I say we got 150,000 people that are engaged with sustainability. Thank you. That, You're yeah, welcome. That, that, yeah, that, thanks for that, that example, Tony. Great. Yeah. So I hope um, everyone that sort of has sort of set the scene for us of, you know, both water as a priority, the importance of um, partnerships, and then this need you know, whether you're a company or government to think not just of water management, but also this broader water stewardship, um, you know, beyond the walls of, of, of each organization. And I want to sort of shift now, um, you know, to look at some more examples um, on the ground and starting with sort of two insights from business and, and civil society on sort of partnerships um, and your in country on the ground. And we'd like to first introduce um, Vimeel Shah, who is the chairman of Bidco Africa, one of East Africa's, in fact, one of Africa's leading um, manufacturers um, of you know, oils. Um, hygiene and beverage products and food and beverages. So, the meal over there, how are you sort of embedding water both within your business and in your supply chains? Can I ask everyone who's not speaking to mute themselves? I'm um, unfortunately not able to mute you centrally. Um, could you mute yourselves so we don't have um, too much feedback? But, the meal over to you in terms of how you're embedding this. Um, yeah, from your company's perspective. Thank you, Jane. I think uh, it's, it's very important that uh, this issue that gets addressed because we talk about uh, triple bottom line these days and a lot of people are not seeing any bottom line. So that's, that's another issue. But I think overall in Kenya, we have a proverb, right? If you want to go fast, you go alone. Uh, if you want to go far, you go together. And I think this is what reflects what we've seen in practice in Kenya over the last decade when it comes to our progress on operationalizing this whole, whole concept. Um, in our companies, we, 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 it's not a part of a, a project or, you know, to say that this is a project, we keep a department that looks after this. It's part of DNA. It's part of uh, what we do every day. So environment and uh, social responsibility is not an option or a program. It's actually something that we do every day and how to operate. So we've gone away from doing good and uh, say, let's do good. We're actually saying, let's being good. It's got, got to being good. And that's quite crucial for us. Um, overall, I think uh, a lot of issues around what um, people can come together because we could do something on our, on our own. But I, I guess the whole concept of bringing people together, and that's what we've done in our companies, in our uh, environment, in our townships, in our counties where we operate. We've created these MSPs and um, these multi-stakeholder partnerships, which have proven quite essential as a tool for supporting companies to look at themselves as not CSR. CSR is cosmetic social responsibility. This is what I call socially responsible corporate. So it's SRC. So socially responsible citizens, socially responsible people. And we've all learned lessons and passed the education around to say, look, if we save money here, if we save wastage here, we could all be better off. And I think more importantly right now, the whole uh, ambition to say, let's become more competitive, let's become more and more uh, easier to do business with. Everybody looks at water as a resource. And we said, if water was the price of petrol or the price of you know, your super petrol, what would you do with it? And then people start saying, yeah, that's true. We would actually conserve it. So I guess that's important. And I think the whole aligning of stakeholder interests was quite crucial. So, when we bring people together, I think uh, the issue around manufacturing and using water. So recycling, reusing, and, and seeing what we can do with it. And there's so many new concepts around, uh, you know, uh, the adequacy of water or inadequacy of water. In our flower farms right now, we have farms where we actually do drip irrigation. We recycle all the water. We have to have dams. It's in a dry area. So we conserve the water, but then we replenish the water and, and, and re reuse it all the time. 
So that way we don't have any, any problems. So that's important, number one. Number two, I think water service providers, governments, NGOs. What we've done in Kenya, we've brought everyone together into multi-stakeholder uh, platforms or partnerships. And let's start looking at various things. One is irrigation. One is uh, farmer-led initiatives. The other one is industrial water management and how do we really make, it, make it happen. And then making a circular economy. It's just not water, it's plastics and everything else we talked about. But looking at a lot of issues where a lot of the um, organizations are supplying water, but then they have non-revenue water where water is getting wasted. So in our companies, yes, reuse, reduce, uh, and also recycle all the water that we've got. That's quite crucial. And I think more important, like MSPs, like um, 2030 WRG, where I co-chair with the chair um, minister, and we've got, got the private sector to in, involved. We've got all the public sectors involved. And we've all come together to identify who are the stakeholders? What do we have to do about this? And identify common challenges and develop a roadmap for tackling these, all coming together. And what's, what this looks like in practice is successfully setting priorities at the highest levels on issues like mainstreaming circular economy principles within the water sector, tackling market structures. I think, uh, again, uh, waste, water, pollution, and of course, inefficiency in use of water. So I think this is something important, but looking at the demand side and the supply side, we say one thing here, um, we have the whole ocean full of water. In fact, the water levels in Lake Victoria today are increasing. Our rain has increased here in, in Kenya. Uh, if you look at the Lake Baringo and Lake Bogoria, they're actually becoming more and more bigger. So there's a lot of water, but I think it's potable water available where it's required. So I think COVID has taught us one thing. The traditional way of uh, supply side, leave it to government to supply it to us. We've all got to be careful, responsible, and take it as, as an important part of our process. Again, these are all priorities that have been set. Uh, we've got people coming together, sensitizing them, and bringing people together to say, get this thing moving. And therefore, we actually measure that on a, on a very regular basis. Again, water efficiency, usage of water, um, you know, treating and not treating it, the cost of treating it. Is, is a big issue. So I guess we talk about successful triple line, tri triple bottom line approaches. We require number one, co common understanding, common approach, a shared vision and a value, and say, fine, it's just not the challenges we are facing. But I think getting agreement for everyone together as industries, as public sector, as private sector, and have collective priorities going forward. Absolutely, no, well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, um, thank you for that, Bimal. And, and I think you um, two key points here. Um, uh, you know, two two key points. One, this concept, as you say, is of a shared vision, um, shared responsibility, and we can say that. But to make it happen, you've got to institutionalize it. And I think a very good example that um, Bimal has shared with us is this joint chairing of a business leader and a government leader. Um, or civil society that jointly chairing the national level coalition. So there is a, a real joint ownership. Um, and from that can come, you know, joint responsibilities and, and joint priority setting. And linked to that, you know, three areas, which I think we'll hear more and more about um, during our conversation is um, where there's great potential to scale is drip irrigation, um, you know, the industrial um, waste management, water waste management, and third, circular economy. And you know, hopefully Water Resources Group can be sharing, um, you know, examples in, in those three areas between countries. So, so thanks very much for your, um, your leadership and, and, and insight. I'd like to now come to um, uh, Mercedes Castro in, in Peru, bright and early in the morning in Peru, Mercedes. And um, you're the, um, the CEO of um, sort of a, a, a business-oriented non-governmental organization, Agua, um, Agua Limpia, working very much at the interface of business, government, and civil society, um, you know, to advocate for policy change and these new models of partnership. So if you could please sort of share some of your views on how you're embedding this and implementing it at the country level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And good morning here from Lima, Peru. Um, Breaking down silos is the title of this section, Jane. So then let's talk about breaking perpetual poverty. Yes, perpetual poverty, which affects millions living in developing countries, and the pandemic is going to worsen the situation. 
According to the World Bank, between 40 to 60 million people will fall into extreme poverty in 2020 because of COVID-19. We have health problems, deaths. Indeed, in my country, in Peru, we see that we were number one in the ranking of mortality rate with COVID-19, with only one, one ICU bed per 20,000 people. And sustainable businesses, informal economy, recession, which is, which in a nutshell is unemployment falling because sales are falling. The world is changing, hopefully to get, uh, to gain resilience, of course, challenging times lie ahead, interesting opportunities, times to mitigate, to remedy. But what about if we move forward, if we transform these challenges into opportunities? What about working on prevention so that future crises due to epidemics, natural disasters, earthquakes and others find us ready, find us ready to act? The creation of the multi-stakeholder platform in Peru started in, in 2014. The seeds we saw, uh, we saw it with the 2030 Water Resources Group turned into a platform, a very strong platform, where public, like ministers of the state, of the state private agents, CEO private companies, the academia and the civil society are acting all for water, all together, accompany and resolve in several water issues very actively. Private companies are already supporting right now when the pandemic started, supporting actions and public work together uh, continuously. We are strongly working and promoting a mechanism called Work for Taxes through which the private enterprises can, can produce public infrastructure for water too, yes. Behind health, behind death, behind poverty, water is always an issue. All the organizations of our multi-state uh, platform in Peru are contributing in concrete ways to highlight the need to place water issues at the top of the government agenda. This is very important. During the last two weeks, we started to collect and put together, put together already concrete, very concrete suggestions from all of our 25 steering board members for the water path for the next government in 2021. We truly believe that this life partnership will definitely position water on the top priority for the upcoming administration in Peru. We are preparing that already. And let me say that for a multi-stake partner, uh, for, the, for a multi-stake uh, partnership to grow, to transcend and last in time, it must always have a neutral outlook, not lean towards political parties, to build confidence, it must have a clean outlook, intensely focused and supporting the pillars of water, which are governance, data for public policy, serious data, and promoting, of course, the value of water. I invite each attendant, each of our friends that are hearing us this morning to encourage your countries in your regions and throughout the planet, the willingness and the ability to put aside fear. Yes, aside fear and to begin today to analyze how to connect and collaborate with the state, with your state, to convene on concrete actions of support and to transform. We must transform that poverty into prosperity. Thank you, Jane. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mercedes. So um, here we have sort of, you know, colleagues, two views, one from sort of a business leader in Kenya, from a civil society um, uh, leader in, in, in Peru um, on you know, what we need to do both you know, from a policy advocacy perspective, but then also, you know, implementing you know, particular sort of tools and business models in areas like drip irrigation um, 
you know, circular economy um, and, and, and industrial wastewater. But Mercedes' point also about the need for good data and joint research and development partnerships is another area where I think these country level coalitions can play a very, very important part um, you know, with local research institutions. So, 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 so thank you for that. What I'd like to do now is sort of shift um, at the country level still to the policy perspective and um, hear from two um, you know, remarkable uh, policy makers. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce Andrew Tumir, who is the Chief Administrative Secretary in the Ministry of Water, Sanitation and Irrigation in Kenya, and also sort of a long-standing leader in, in food and agriculture more generally. I mean, Andrew, if you could sort of share with us, um, you know, how you're working on a cross-ministerial basis. We've heard now of, of business and civil society working with government. How are you working across government to move this agenda forward? Um, thank you, Jen. I hope you can hear me well. Perfectly. Greetings, thanks. greetings to all of you from Kenya, more specifically from the Ministry of Water, Sanitation and Irrigation. Um, this novel coronavirus has really underscored the importance of enhancing global cooperation and partnership amongst uh, all sectors and stakeholders. Um, a people-centered approach is crucial during any pandemic and remains so in the recovery period too. Uh, locally led responses that bring stakeholders together across sectors to understand the challenges they face, uh, develop shared priorities and work in groups to pilot cost-effective solutions are therefore crucial. In so doing, they find new ways of implementing existing policy and informing policy change. And in the process, they build uh, the political capital that change actually requires. In this way, the multi-sector uh, platforms enable governments to make the tough policy choices needed in an inclusive and transparent uh, way. Uh, COVID specifically has put a spotlight on the importance of water and the importance of focusing on the resilience of our water systems. Hand washing with soap and water remains one of our best defenses against the virus, uh, as we saw very well here in Kenya. And until an effective treatment or vaccine is developed, making access to safe and reliable water and sanitation services uh, is a cornerstone of efforts to contain the spread of the virus. Looking ahead, uh, safely managed water, sanitation and hygiene services will be crucial uh, to mitigate secondary impacts on businesses, community livelihoods and well-being during the recovery uh, phase. Moving from response to resilience requires that we come together in prioritizing water for growth uh, people and the environment. In Kenya, we have committed to breaking down the institutional and sectoral silos that have so far often uh, stimulated our thinking on such shared resources and challenges. As a ministry, we have found that by working with partners like the uh, WRG and opening up the water resource management space to a diversity of stakeholders, we actually help to stimulate innovative thinking, collaboration and solutions. Increasing private sector partnership or engagement, for example, through public-private uh, uh, partnerships and other strategic public-private joint ventures has been successful in funneling our capital, innovation and expertise into the nation's water sector. The 2030 uh, WRG has been an instrumental player in this regard, helping to spearhead the adoption of new technologies, uh, financing mechanisms, Delivery models, voluntary standards, and policy and regulatory innovations are required to address the gap between water supply and demand. This collaborative approach has helped to build a trusted relationships between different sectors as well as across silos within a government and industry. As we look into the future, in terms of the role of MSPs in driving change and ensuring resilient and long-term collaboration in the context of pandemics, uh, there is a value in looking at the underpinnings of what has made 2030 uh, WRG a model in multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships. Uh, one, the government in the lead, recognizing the central role and ultimate responsibility of government in managing water resources, MSPs can help to fill the capacity gaps and overcome the political constraints governments often face in doing it effectively. Number two, local ownership and collaboration from business and civil society 
uh, greater inclusion and decision making by local business and civic leaders is essential in identifying shared priorities, designing feasible solutions and creating incentives and buying in needed for uh, implementation. And three, a combined uh, focus on data and analysis, a stakeholder dynamics and the political economy of, of change. This rigorous and reliable data analysis must be combined with an appreciation of the institutional and political uh, context. WRG has demonstrated that MSPs are effective in tackling complex systemic challenges, which, ex uh, exactly, which is exactly the situation countries face in addressing the COVID-19 crisis and its aftermath. So in brief, uh, I would like to say that MSPs are therefore uh, an essential tool to promote synergies uh, between key stakeholders, uh, helping communities to recover and to build more sustainable and resilient and inclusive societies. Uh, thank you and a nice forum for all of us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Andrew. And I think I've been um, you're particularly inspired um, by how you're working across your government ministries, um, not just in response to you know COVID-19, but you know your innovation, um, you know ministries, your agriculture, your um, your commerce, you know you responsible for water sanitation and irrigation. And I think um, you know one of the things I hope Water Resources Group can do is share some good practices on what's happening within government just like we talk about business working with each other, how are government ministries working with each other to move this agenda forward? And I think you have, you know, good, good, good examples of that. And I think one other very important message that comes out from Andrew's comments is this, this need to be people centered. Um, I heard someone say the other day that, you know, the pandemic has reminded us that we need to listen to the scientists and we need to listen to the people. <laughs> And being people centered, whether it's farmers, whether it's, you know, small and micro enterprises, whether it's, um, uh, you know, women and youth, you're being very people centered when you're in a position of power, whether it's a position of business power or government power, um, you know, I think is, is, is very important and putting, you know, people at the core of what we're trying to achieve, because ultimately it's about how do we harness water to improve and protect people's lives and their livelihoods. Um, you know, at the at the at the local level. So thank you, Andrew. And I'd like to keep to the sort of policy agenda and um, call on my my good colleague um, um, K V Raju, who is the um, chief economic advisor to the government of Uttar Pradesh in India, but has also advised, I think, um, you know, five other or four other state governments um, in India. Um, and it'd be very helpful, K V, to get from your side what are sort of some of the policy instruments and incentives. Um, that you think have worked the best in terms of putting water at the at the at the center of the agenda. Uh, thank you, Jane. Thanks for the opportunity, both to the World Bank and uh, WRG 2030. Uh, let me tell you, this COVID-19 has given us an opportunity. Even though it's a problem, we thought this is a great opportunity to do something good. Specific to the water sector, we did a couple of things as both Jane and uh, Mari has been putting up in the last one hour or so. Let me share what we have done. But before that, why we are done what we are done, we should explain to the other participants. Uttar Pradesh is the largest state with a 240 million population and with an economy of 245 billions and we hope to do that a one trillion in the next five years to come this is where we stand this is the size and we have a 75 provinces or a districts if those who want to know about the size of the spread of the state now definitely we use this opportunity number one to consolidate the water resources departments, as some of you may be knowing, South Asian countries have departments for drinking water, department for the irrigation, department of mineral irrigation, all these. So we combine together. We formed a single ministry as a water resources ministry. In local terms, it's called as a Jal Shakti ministry. The first of its nature formed in the entire 30, across the 31 states of India. This is number one. Number two. <clears throat> How did we bring the large number of migrant laborers 
because of the COVID, when they moved back and forth, and UP alone has something like a 3.8 million migrant laborers. When we became together, we created an opportunity to utilize them in the canal desilting and small water bodies desilting, which enables better water storage flows across the things. For your kind information, Uttar Pradesh alone registered a 20% increase in the net crop area sold during this season, crop season. That's the first of its kind in the last few decades that we are done. How we are using the problem as an opportunity. The third one is, I think, WRG 2030 through the multi-stakeholder platforms enabled and assisted the Uttar Pradesh government in preparing the most innovative water policy, water resources policy. Now we are trying to work with mere policy is not enough, but we need an implementation plan. So it goes hand in hand. What would be useful? Now, Jane is talking about, and Mary is also talking about. I mean, on behalf of the UP government, I earnestly request all the partners, what Mary has been putting down, all the partners to join this. Probably we can share the, the draft version of the water policy. And the partners, if they join now as a part of the innovative financing, either a hybrid annuity model or on the PPP model, that would be really useful to the state, a large state like this. I think we need to bring those kind of a partnerships. In terms of technology for increasing the water use efficiency, even a 10% or a 5% on an annual basis would be a big booster for a state like Uttar Pradesh. We need to bring in these innovative technologies for this. Not just the drip and sprinkler irrigation. We need to look at these things. Now, look at the the financing option, that's where I think the World Bank and the other bigger financial institutions need to play a good role here, of bringing the convergence. And any anyway, of WRG 2030 is doing a fantastic work in bringing the multi-stakeholder platforms, which enables even the farmers are willing to pay. They are willing to pay double whatever they are paying for the water fee. You know, that's where we should utilize. Farmers are willing to pay, but the question they ask is, what is there for me? Do I get a better returns by my increased share of payments? They're willing to pay. So all those surveys are of willingness to pay. We need to utilize this opportunity. Definitely there's an opportunity. We should use this. Now, one more from the policy level, as Jan was mentioning, one is river basin planning. We are definitely planning for it. And the new water policy definitely focuses adequately on this. We are creating restructuring the department. This is what has been proposed, restructuring the department onto the river basin models. So realigning the staff, reskilling the staff, and then refocusing on what river basin and sub basins can do. Number two on the project financing models. That's where we need to bring in how much project on its own can generate as a revenue, plus in addition to that, the other innovation financing can do. Small intervention we are trying to do with the Japanese government health. We are trying to bring in solar energy in a bigger way. To begin with in the phase one, something like 100 megawatts on the river basins, on the, the water resources ministry area, if you put that, I think the high cost power currently we are using for the huge 35,000 tubules, maybe that might be swallowed with swap with the low cost solar energy. We need to think on this. This is what we are trying to do is probably first of its kind in the entire country. We are trying to do this. In addition to that, as is in the other parts of the globe, the individual level or a group level solar energy based uh, utilization is also coming up, but we have a long way. We are trying to do the large scale solar energy parks, solar cell parks. If there's a promoter of that, we are also bringing up in a big way into the farmers, producers organizations, FPOs or FP farmer producer companies, about 100, 134 companies 
are currently at various stages of functioning and also procurement. For your kind information, you might be like to know this. During the COVID, we used former producer companies to make a procurement of products, food grains and non-food grains, perishable commodities. That was a huge booster for the farmers. We're also trying to see the decentralized pollution control at various stages. I think WRG did a good job in the one of the river basin in Hindon there in tracking down the water pollution levels. And then definitely those who are interested in this group and the pollution levels, at least in India. I mean, so as I'm sure the climate change has shown that 7% decline in the pollution level, CO2 levels. But then you be so the famous Ganga Basin, the yeah. Ganges rivers have shown a significant decline in the water pollution levels. Well, we should be thankful for the COVID, but we can't have the COVID for long. And yeah. this has shown definitely as doable options. I stop here. If there are any questions, I'm willing to add it. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, KV, and for the you know, important role that you play. And I think, um, you know, two very important um, messages coming out for me. One is, um, you know, just as we're, we have to take a more holistic approach to water, um, you know, along value chains and think of water as a public health good and environmental good, as well as important for economic growth. I think your point about linking energy strategies and water strategies together um, and you know trying to strengthen both you know the water and sanitation system and the energy system in a holistic way and making that integrated into you know, policy and 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 um, planning um is a you know is a, is a is a very important message so i think that's another sort of almost sort of policy tool just like the work for taxes or something that they're doing in peru that could be shared elsewhere you know how you're linking the energy and water um agendas i think is a is you know some 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 hopefully some useful useful insights to share. Um, we're as always um, beginning to run run short on time, but I do see we have one question here from Dimitri um, about harnessing and, and mobilizing technologies, and particularly sharing technologies and spreading them more to developing countries. And you know we we always are talking about innovation and new technologies, and there's obviously with the digital. Um, you know, revolution and digital transformation, there is an enormous amount we're going to be able to do on improving water management and water stewardship with, you know, stronger AI data. But there are basic traditional technologies like drip irrigation and, um, you know, sort of other, other technologies which need to just be spread more. And I, um, Tony, uh, I'm at the risk of putting you on the, on, on, yes. on the spot here, um, you know, what's your thought before I, I um, sort of move to the value chain discussion? On no, no. How can yeah. we scale long term traditional technologies, which, um, you know, are still not scaling as much as should do? Right. Uh, but th th this uh, I want to go address his real question It was about, you know, um, uh, wastewater. And, and I think that was around the technology and, the, and I, the technologies are there and the BTS systems are coming on. Uh, whether we've got like a malt facility, we've got uh, uh, natural gas uh, flaring, uh, and how do you capture that natural gas? Well, we're, we're capturing and then kind of uh, putting it back into our malt facility to use so that biogas is there. I think the other thing is the BTS system and cleaning up water. Uh, we're getting really, really close to getting that effluent. You know, once the water's cleaned, instead of just turning the effluent back into the sewage, can it be used by, say, farmers and, 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 and others to then uh, uh, irrigate their crops and things? So there's a ton of innovation coming on on technology around water, cleaning of water from an industrial standpoint. And I think that was his real question. I think the other part where you were bringing up on the drip irrigation, yeah, uh, those are all techniques um, that if we can get to the farmers. The interesting part is, is how, how, how do you get it to the small stakeholder? And that's, that's really the, the transfer of that technology, especially on water, that we've got to figure out. On the large scale commercial farmers, that's easy, right? I mean, you've got the pivot, you've got the, the drip irrigation, and that works really well. But the small stakeholder, that's where we're really tackling. And I got to tell you, that's where uh, my team's focus is on the really small stakeholder. And we just haven't figured that out yet. Yeah. Hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a, you know, um, you know, both of those examples 
you know, sort of remind us of the, the importance of a, you know, a circular economy approach. And oh. also, you know, recognizing that often the technologies are there. It's the lack of financing policy environment and business models that are needed. I, 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 uh, let me throw on this, Jane, because I think you brought that up, the circularity actually of water waste. We're looking at that right now. And is there, is, are there other businesses, you know, on the circularity? You know, the ability to clean that water uh, brings off what I call sludge. Is that an, a natural um, uh, organic um, uh, fertilizer? Can there be things that you do? I mean, there's a bunch of stuff. I mean, there's CO2 uh, throw off that comes off of our, our, our water processes also. Can you capture that and do things with it? So there's a lot of things we're looking at on circularity. Good, good. And, and yeah. I hope that's something Water Resources Group. Definitely. Can, um, Definitely. Know, I, I have, take, we'll share it. Yeah, to, to, to share. Great. Well, th thanks very much um, um, for the, the, the speakers and insights in, in, in this section. And so I think, you know, we've sort of heard, uh, you know, from both the business perspective, civil society leadership perspective and government perspective, um, you know, of the, of the opportunities for, for, for working together, um, you know, at the country level. And what I'd like to shift now um, is, is how do we work more together across value chains and what can we be doing to transform value chains and we've got three um your know, great perspectives of um you know sort of food and beverage um agri agri value chains to um you know share some views from what i call a you know an off taker and a retailer perspective from um from coca-cola company an input provider perspective um from um from jane irrigation and very importantly as i was saying earlier a farmer's perspective um, and you know, someone who's actually having to really do it on the ground. So I would like to, um, as we go into the session on looking at value chain transformation, start with um, with um, the Coca Cola company and um, AJ Batija, who is the managing director of Coca Cola in Bangladesh. And um, like AB and um, Inbev, um, the Coca Cola company has been on the water journey for a um, you know for a, a long time and sometimes competing with each other, often in partnership with each other. Um, can you say a little bit, AJ, about how we transform value chains and particularly um, aggregation technology and market linkages, how we can combine the technology with business model and market linkages innovation? Thank you, Jane. Uh, I'll try my best to give it a shot. Um, so first of all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and a very good evening to all. I uh, would like to thank uh, WRG and the World Bank for giving uh, Coca-Cola Bangladesh an opportunity to present at this forum. Uh, Bangladesh is a land of rivers with almost one third of its total area being water. However, water, nature, environment, we know that any developmental activity has an impact on environment. For this formulation and implementation of environment-friendly development projects, are required to preserve our nature and ecosystem. And sustainable development is possible only if civil society and NGOs, the government and the industry collaborate and co-create. This will help build on the vision of the Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, uh, where she wanted the government uh, to desire an integrated and sustainable development of water resources to supply safer water to all Sustainability development goals of 2030 before the SDGs time frame of 2030. Now, just to give you a perspective of Coca Cola in Bangladesh, Coca Cola has been operating in Bangladesh for over six decades and is today uniquely local, with over 90% of our raw materials being low sourced locally. Our great brands are all locally manufactured and brought to market by a local workforce. We are happy to say that Coca Cola is made in and made for Bangladesh consumers. Now, sustainable development is at the heart of everything we do and is reflected in any part of the world we operate in. We truly believe in and live by the concept of the golden triangle, which is purposeful partnership, partnerships where we collaborate with civil society and NGOs and the government to ensure we deliver on Coca-Cola's global purpose of refreshing the world and making a difference. Let me give you a perspective of how we put this purpose into action and, and impact the value chain like Jane just spoke about. So Coca-Cola Foundation and Coca-Cola Company are currently 
to improving the agricultural value chain in the water stressed Barind region of Bangladesh through introducing water efficient technology or what we call IWET project in. Department of Agriculture Extension, Research Institute, Bangladesh Rice Research Institute, the Syngenta Foundation, the Dasco Foundation, private entrepreneurs, and of course, 2030 WRG. Under Bangladesh Water Multi Stakeholder Partnership, IWET project is driving a successful public private community partnership in the field to train and motivate Barind mango uh, growers to focus on water efficient drip irrigation based ultra high density mango production and also energize rice cultivators to apply alternate bedding and drying technology to lower irrigation requirement. Building on from 2018 in 2020, the project has successfully motivated 10,000 farmers from three districts in the water stress northwest region with an aim to expand services to more farmers in coming years. Talk see IWET is also benefiting the greater community through promoting business rural entrepreneurship. On ground we have now 20 plus agro service centers which we call farmer hubs that are catering to farmer needs for better seeds, high quality farming tools and community market for selling producers. Women are also coming forward both as entrepreneurs and employees to such service centers. This year, even in COVID-19, the situation that we have, the pandemic that we have, mango have a, had a bumper harvest and mangoes produced in IWET gardens or orchards were driven to urban households of Dhaka through online sales portal, empowering the farmers and enhancing their income. Going forward, we believe that more widespread use of AWD, which is alternate wetting and drying, rice and accelerating the transition to non-rice cash crops like fruits, vegetables would save more than 50% of the irrigation water requirement in this water stressed region. The Coca-Cola company is committed to its support to the IWET project and the Bangladesh MSP to see much scope for further engagement. Coca-Cola Bangladesh in addition to this IWET project has also been on the steering board, has been a steering board member of the water MSP from the beginning and has been taking part in multiple streams like governance, industrial water, wastewater, and even valuing of water where we had uh, a long WRG workshop. We also tried and the first company to get the water extraction license for our Baluka plant and having a 100% treatment of our wastewater. We have angle to empower not just the communities when it comes to water, but also empowering over 100,000 women in Bangladesh through the Women Business Center. An inclusive focus on environmental, social and governance issues is an integral part of how we in the Coca-Cola system conduct business and interact with our environment and community. All in all, we strongly believe that sustainable and inclusive growth is a journey we all have to undertake together to enable a prosperous and sustainable Bangladesh and for the well-being and the safety of our wonderful planet. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank, thank you, AJ. And I think three very, very important messages coming out there. We are about businesses being too short-term focused and quarterly focused. And you know, we have examples of you know, companies on the call who have been around for, you know, over a hundred years, and in your case, in Bangladesh for sixty years, you know, with with with, with local leadership. So I think a you know, very important thing of you know, thinking of companies as as long term partners. Um, you know, secondly, I think a great example of how along a value chain you're combining digital technology, um, you know, agri processing technology, water technologies, um, you know, to to bring them together to really um, you know, support the farmer um, as a supplier. And to be a quality supplier to you as a as a, as a large company, um, and I think very um, important. Thirdly, this whole concept of sharing value more along the value chain. So you are giving more value back to the farmers in addition to giving the technical support and and providing market linkages by sort of you're developing new higher um, you know value crops. You're, you're you're both saving water but bringing value 
commercial value back to the farmers, which is a good sort of segue to go to um, Anil Jain, who is the vice chair and managing director of Jain Irrigation, which probably needs no, no introduction to everyone on this call, the second largest micro irrigation company in the world, which has been an incredible partner with millions of farmers and you know, well over 120 countries um, as an input provider on the irrigation side. Anil would like to you know, hear from you um, yeah, how you think the sort of value chain strengthening uh, operates from your perspective. Uh, thank you, Jane, and good day, everybody. Uh, you know, today we have spoken about, you know, the policy, uh, the economy, uh, and the water uh, overall. Uh, just to quickly uh, talk a little bit about our company, uh, we have done, we have dealt with almost more than 8 million small farmers uh, in India alone. And we do deal with more than millions of farmers outside yeah. India also. Now, these millions of farmers to whom we have reached out to in India, especially they're small, their average size is hardly two to three acres only. And these farmers, our focus has not been just to provide them drip irrigation, which helps them save water. And in fact, if I just look at last decade, decade and a half, our products have helped farmers to save more than I think more than 130 billion cubic meters of water. And that's a large amount of you know, water being saved. But the focus has been not only to save the water, but use that water to improve productivity. And productivity gains have to be you know, not just incremental, but they have to be exponential. And we have seen the farmers growing somewhere between 30 to 200, 200% more output on one hand, while saving 50 to 60% of uh, water. So it's, it is a double whammy. You save water, but also you produce more. But again, saving water, producing more, you know, a farmer is an entrepreneur and is providing a lot of that service, but he must become prosperous at the end. So on an average, I think our farmers who work hard have been able to grow their income three to four times during, you know, last two or three decades we have worked and these farmers earlier used to earn, let's say, 100 or $200 per acre, but they are now are able to earn uh, three to 400 or 500. Some farmers go even $2,000 per acre per year income or per crop income. So that's what we do in terms of providing knowledge and irrigation technology. But we are also a large company, which is not very well known, that we are one of the largest processes of fruits and vegetables in the country. So we buy from farmers almost more than 500,000 tons of fruits and vegetables. We process those. So we give knowledge to the farmers to improve their productivity. We give assured uh, output evacuation. We buy back from them what they grow. And we also provide assurance prices, which have a market floor. But if market price is higher, we give them more. So they have a floor which gives them a reasonable price, but if market price is higher, we give them closer to the market price. So it's a win-win kind of a combo situation with which we deal with. So almost we buy from close to 200,000 farmers, various fruits and vegetables. And the products we make, we deal with Coca-Cola, for example, in India is one of our largest customers. We also deal with Unilever, Nestle, such companies, uh, and help them provide ingredients coming from these fruits, vegetables. So we, we participate in the entire agri value chain and we deal with small farmers. And it has been, I think, our fortune to see that these farmers have not only ability to absorb technology, but ability to really grow as entrepreneurs, you know, treat agriculture as a business, improve productivity, improve prosperity for themselves, and at the same time, nurture the nature itself so that you don't waste the resources, right? You do development but you don't compromise the environment or the mother, mother earth for that matter. So this work which these farmers do especially is so critical. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we have now started working even on rice, for example. You know, rice is a crop done under the water, right? You rarely you need deep water. We have now promoting technology. We are working with the farmers where you will not see any water in the field, right? All the water will be provided under the soil. And on an average to create one kilo of rice, you require, depending on how inefficient current system is, between two to 3,000 liters of water to create one kilo of rice. We are able to save almost 70 to 80 percent of that water using the technology we talked about. And that would also be good for public health because farmers don't have to go into the water. They don't get those waterborne diseases, etc., etc. Now, 
while trying to do this, the larger challenge we face is the financing. I think we have worked with the government in India and other places. They provide assistance to the farmers to buy irrigation technologies. But right time, adequate financing is crucial. Also, working with farmers is important because the farmers have suffered so long in a society. They have been the producer, but not getting the return, right? Larger society, you know, all of us mostly do not remember our grocery bills on a monthly basis, right? Because food is so cost effectively available, made available by farmers, but farmers have suffered. For centuries, they have remained centuries poor. They have remained and poor. Our and focus has been how do we create solutions to make them uh, prosperous? And in the process, we are in this process, uh, there was this question about circular economy. We are also providing more than 3,000 acres of area where we do R&D, where hundreds of thousands of farmers come and visit. And we provide free knowledge, training, uh, et cetera, to uh, these farmers. And in terms of building uh, this whole, what you call uh, circular economy and value chain, for example, uh, we have started processing spices. So we are helping farmers to grow spices we buy. And we have introduced those spices now, a combination of spices as an immunity booster in the COVID. So, you know, you are connecting public health with good farming, making farmer prosperous, but at the same time ensuring that the nature will not get compromised because it's, you know, it's a cliche to say that we need to save for the next generation. But, you know, even current generation, the people yeah. who have been poor for so long, first you help them to become better, more prosperous, and then is what you can do for everybody else. And India has 120 million small farmers. We have dealt with only 8 million. So my life, our next generation life, 12,000 people working in our company. There is a lot of work for next few decades to continue to work on this. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Anil. And I think again, we have both Jane Irrigation, Cola Company and Avian InBev that we heard earlier, how you're taking this holistic approach to be more inclusive and improve farmer incomes and productivity and efficiency, to be more sustainable from an environmental perspective, but also to you know, uh, uh, work with farmers to produce healthy and nutritious foods, both for the farmers and for consumers. So thank you. And I'd like to come to, you know, very importantly, the farmer perspective. We talk about putting farmers at the center and I'm, we're very honored to have Nigapa Sandigawad with us today, who has been not only a farmer and a farmer entrepreneur, um, for 40, over, um, nearly 50 years now, but also very much a community leader um, in, the, in, the, in the farming community um, where he lives and, and operates. So Nigapa, it'd be excellent to just have very quickly from you, you know, some of the lessons and, um, you know, that you can share with other farmers on the benefits of working in these multi-stakeholder partnerships. Over to you, sir. Namaste, Eldrigo. My name is uh, Ningappa Sandigwad, uh, Amravati village, Talukonugal, Bagalkot district, Karnataka, from India. Kiruparchya, this is the first time I was in the Grama Matadu. This is the first time I was in the Grama Matadu. I Danewadagolo, uh Ramtal project by Gihelo Dadre, Uttara Karnataka, Wando, Yesha Deli attempt to Dodda Dadondo, uh attempt to Dodda Dadondo project. Arwatu Saura Ekre Niraure in Walagondir Takanta on the Yojene, either Le Adine Saura Jana, Raitra Bartadara, Arwatu Saur Ekre, Niraure Agonto and Dirale, and the Yard Pratish the company or one to the Jane Irrigation, Matu Netapim Company. Brat company golo, even the carry up carry on Kaigondito, Kada has no Yarsa has no drinda, Pararam Bishi, Bautikawagi Raita on the Sabakatu on the Yojanagiro Rinda, Raita and Walagondo, Madurakata on the Caravano, Kavala Kavijan Matu, company golo, Walagondo, Caravan Mukta Golishurpare, Adre. Raitar on the Sabagito and Walgunda the Karna, Raitar Tirulke, Verde the Karna, Yojenu, Mandatil Sagur today. Is on a Puna Promana del Mugisolo, Solpa Ititlagi, Dimac Canto on the company, Mato Valmi, Kada, 
ಜೊತೆ ಜೊತೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಕೃಷಿ ಇಲಾಖೆ ತೋಟಗಾರಿಕೆ ಎಲ್ಲ ಒಂದು ಒಳಗೊಂಡು ಈ ಒಂದು ಯೋಜನೆ ಸಫಲಗೊಳಿಸ್ಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಸಾಕಷ್ಟು ಪ್ರಯತ್ನ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಈ ಒಂದು ಯೋಜನೆ ಫಲಪ್ರದವಾದಾಗ ಒಂದು ನಮ್ಮ ಈ ಯೋಜನೆ ವ್ಯಾಪ್ತಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಬರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಜಮೀನು ಪೂರ್ತಿ ಬ್ಲ್ಯಾಕ್ ಕಾಟನ್ ಸಾಯಿಲ್ ಬ್ಲ್ಯಾಕ್ ಕಾಟನ್ ಸಾಯಿಲ್ ಅಂದರೆ ನಮ್ಮಲ್ಲಿ ಬೆಳೀತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಬೆಳೆಗಳು ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನಲ್ ಆಗಿ ಸೀರಿಯಲ್ಸು ಮಿಲೆಟ್ಸು ಆಯಿಲ್ ಶೀಟ್ಸು ಕಮರ್ಷಿಯಲ್ ಕ್ರಾಪ್ಸ್ ಇವೆಲ್ಲನೂ ಬೆಳೀತದೆ ಇವೆಲ್ಲ ಪಲ್ಸಸ್ ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಹೊರತುಪಡಿಸಿ ಎಲ್ಲ ಬೆಳೆಗಳು ಆರ್ಗ್ಯಾನಿಕ್ ಫಾರ್ಮಿಂಗ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ಬೆಳೀತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಈ ಒಂದು ಆರ್ಗ್ಯಾನಿಕ್ ಫಾರ್ಮಿಂಗ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ಕೇವಲ ಒಂದೇ ಒಂದು ಬೆಳೀತಾ ಇರೋದ್ರಿಂದ ಆ ಬೆಳೆಗಳು ಮಳೆಗಾಲದಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾತ್ರ ಬೆಳೀಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಸಾಧ್ಯತೆ ಇತ್ತು ಈ ಒಂದು ಯೋಜನೆ ಬಂದಾಗಿನಿಂದ ಮುಂಗಾರಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಒಂದು ಬೆಳೆ ಹಿಂಗಾರಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಒಂದು ಬೆಳೆ ಮುಂಗಾರಿ ಅರ್ಲಿ ಬಿತ್ತನೆ ಆಗಿರೋದ್ರಿಂದ ಕಟಾವಿನ ನಂತರ ಬೇಸಿಗೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಮತ್ತೊಂದು ಬೆಳೆ ಬೆಳೀಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಪೂರ್ತಿ ಪ್ರಮಾಣದ ನೀರು ಒದಗಿಸಿದಾಗ ನೂರಕ್ಕೆ ನೂರ ಐವತ್ತು ಪರ್ಸೆಂಟ್ ಬಿತ್ತನೆ ಕಾರ್ಯ ಕೈಕೊಳ್ಬೋದು ಈ ಒಂದು ಕಾರಣ ಇದನ್ನ ಮನಗಂಡು ಒಂದು ಸೀರಿಯಲ್ಸ್ ಮಿಲೆಟ್ಸ್ ಪಲ್ಸಸ್ ಇವನ್ನೆಲ್ಲನೂ ಮಾರುಕಟ್ಟೆ ವ್ಯವಸ್ಥೆ ಮುಖ್ಯವಾಗಿ ನಮಗೆ ತೊಂದರೆ ಆಗಿರೋದು ಮಾರುಕಟ್ಟೆ ಈ ಮಾರುಕಟ್ಟೆ ವ್ಯವಸ್ಥೆ ಸರಿಪಡಿಸಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಇ ವೈ ಅಂತ ಏನೋ ಕಂಪ್ನಿ ಇದೆ ಅದು ಡಿಮ್ಯಾಕ್ ಯೋಜನೆ ರಿಪ್ಟ್ ಮಾರ್ಕೆಟ್ ಆ ಮಾರ್ಕೆಟ್ ಯೋಜನೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಒಂದು ನಾನು ಒಂದು ಡಬ್ಲ್ಯೂ ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಪ್ರೆಸಿಡೆಂಟ್ ಎಂ ಬಿ ಬಸವೇಶ್ವರ್ ನೀರು ಬಳಕೆ ಆದ ಸಂಘದ ಅಧ್ಯಕ್ಷ ಜೊತೆ ಜೊತೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಈ ಒಂದು ಹತ್ತು ನೀರು ಬಳಕೆ ಆದ ಸಂಘದ ಸದಸ್ಯರನ್ನ ಅಧ್ಯಕ್ಷರನ್ನ ಸೇರಿಕೊಂಡು ನಿರ್ಮಾಣ ಮಾಡತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಒಂದು ಎಫ್ ಪಿ ಒ ಫಾರ್ಮರ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಕಂಪ್ನಿ ಅಮೃತ ಫಾರ್ಮರ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಕಂಪ್ನಿ ಈ ಪ್ರೊಡಕ್ಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಕಂಪ್ನಿ ಮುಖಾಂತರ ರೈತರಿಗೆ ಬೇಕಾದಂತ ಕಡಿಮೆ ಬೆಲೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಹೋಲ್ಸೇಲ್ ದರದಲ್ಲಿ ರೈತರಿಗೆ ಬೇಕಾದ ಇನ್ಪುಟ್ ಬೀಜ ಗೊಬ್ಬರ ಔಷಧಿ ಮತ್ತು ತಾಂತ್ರಿಕ ಸಲಹೆಯನ್ನು ಕೊಡೋದ್ರ ಜೊತೆ ಜೊತೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾರುಕಟ್ಟೆ ವ್ಯವಸ್ಥೆಯನ್ನು ಕೂಡ ನಾವು ಮುಂದಿನ ದಿನಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಕೈಗೊಳ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀವಿ ಈ ಡಬ್ಲ್ಯೂ ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಮುಖಾಂತರ ವಾಟರ್ ಯೂಸರ್ಸ್ ಕೋಆಪರೇಟಿವ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಮುಖಾಂತರ ಕಳೆದ ವರ್ಷದಲ್ಲಿ ಅಂದಾಜು ಒಂದೂವರೆ ಕೋಟಿ ಮೊತ್ತದ ವ್ಯವಹಾರವನ್ನು ಮಾಡಿ ರೈತರಿಗೆ ಅದರ ಲಾಭವನ್ನು ದೊರಕಿಸಿಕೊಡಲ್ಲಿ ಸಫಲರಾಗಿದ್ದೇವೆ ಜೊತೆ ಜೊತೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಈಗ ಕಳೆದ ಮೂರು ತಿಂಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ರೈತರಿಗೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಡಿಮ್ಯಾಕ್ ಯೋಜನೆಯ ರಾಮತಾಳ ಪ್ರಾಜೆಕ್ಟ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ಬರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥ ರೈತರಿಗೆ ಬೀಜಗಳ ವ್ಯವಸ್ಥೆ ಮೂಲ ಬೀಜಗಳು ಅಂದರೆ ಬೀಜೋತ್ಪಾದನೆಗೆ ಬೇಕಾದಂಥ ಬೀಜಗಳನ್ನು ಒದಗಿಸಿ ಬೀಜಗಳು ತೊಗರಿ ಈ ಸತ್ಯ ಕಡಲೆ ಮುಂಗಾರಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಮೆಣಸಿನಕಾಯಿ ಉಳ್ಳಾಗಡ್ಡಿ ಇವೆಲ್ಲನೂ ಬೆಳೀಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಅವಕಾಶ ಮಾಡಿಕೊಟ್ಟು ಮುಂದಿನ ಅವ್ರು ಬೆಳೆದಂಥ ಬೆಳೆನ ನೇರ ಮಾರುಕಟ್ಟೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾರುಕಟ್ಟೆ ಮಾಡಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಮತ್ತು ಎಮ್ ಎಸ್ ಪಿ ದರದಲ್ಲಿ ಖರೀದಿ ಮಾಡಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಕೂಡ ನಮ್ಮಲ್ಲಿ ಈ ಒಂದು ಯೋಜನೆ ಹಾಕ್ಕೊಂಡಿದ್ದೀವಿ ಈ ಎಲ್ಲನೂ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಈ ಒಂದು ಯೋಜನೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಬೆಳೀತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಎಲ್ಲ ಬೆಳೆಗಳು ಸಾ ಸಾವಯವ ಕೃಷಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಅಂದರೆ ನ್ಯಾಚುರಲ್ ಫಾರ್ಮಿಂಗ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ಬೆಳೀತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಬೆಳೆಗಳಾಗಿರೋದ್ರಿಂದ ಅದರಲ್ಲಿ ವಿಷಮುಕ್ತವಾಗಿರುತ್ತವೆ ಇವರು ಇವುಗಳಿಗೆ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಬೆಲೆ ಬೆಳೆ ಬರಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಬೆಲೆ ಸಿಗಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ಮುಂದಿನ ದಿನಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ನಮ್ಮ ಎಫ್ ಪಿ ಒ ಮುಖಾಂತರ ಫಾರ್ಮರ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಕಂಪ್ನಿ ಮುಖಾಂತರ ವ್ಯಾಲ್ಯೂಯೆಡ್ ಪ್ರೊಡಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಮಾಡಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಪ್ರೊಸೆಸಿಂಗ್ ಅಂದರೆ ಪ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ನಂತರ ಪ್ರೊಸೆಸಿಂಗ್ ಪ್ರೊಸೆಸಿಂಗ್ ನಂತರ ಪ್ರೊಕ್ಯೂರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಸೆಸಿಂಗ್ ಪ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಪ್ರೊಸೆಸಿಂಗ್ ಪ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಪ್ರೊಕ್ಯೂರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಇವು ಮಾರುಕಟ್ಟೆ ಮಾರುಕಟ್ಟೆ ದರ ಏರಿಳಿತವಾದಾಗ ಒಂದು ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಬೆಲೆ ಸಿಗಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ವ್ಯಾಲ್ಯೂ ಅಡಿಷನ್ ಮಾಡಬೇಕಾಗತ್ತೆ ಒಂದು ವ್ಯಾಲ್ಯೂ ಅಡಿಷನ್ ಮಾಡಿರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಸೆಕ
Ngapa's comments will be translated. Some of them have been translated in the chat box. And um, thank you, Ngapa, thank you, thank for your, you. your leadership at the local community. And I think a very important example of how, you know, farmers are stewards of the land and the soil and the farm and nature. You are a businessman and an entrepreneur, but also a community leader working you know with government and other farmers within your community to move the agenda forward so thank you thank, thank you, you for being with us um today so that has sort of i hope given you all a, a a tour of the many different areas where the water resources group is working um you know at the policy level at the value chain level um both input and um sort of offtake companies as well as at the at the farmer and the farmer organization level. Um, I would just sort of like to make three closing comments before handing over to um, to, to Jürgen Pohele um, from, from the World Bank. I think sort of three key things come out for me from today. First of all, each of us, whether we're a business leader, a farmer, a policymaker, should be focusing on the priorities for our organization, our individual organizational leadership and you know where we have the greatest capability and capacity to make a difference and then secondly working together through these multi-stakeholder partnerships that um, water resources group um, have have developed you know how can we bring together these three areas of innovation that i spoke about policy innovation and sort of your know, policy incentives smart subsidies um, you know policy makers working to put water at the center technology and business model innovation and how we can you know spread both old technologies and make sure they scale but also bring in digital technology with uh, other 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 more traditional technologies and how can we influence and change business models um, you know to be both more inclusive but also more productive and sustainable and then thirdly financing innovation <laughs> And how do we you know, work with new financing instruments, blended financing, um, you know, that can, can also help to move the agenda forward. And I think these multi-stakeholder partnerships at the country level are bringing all of those together, policy, business model and technology and financing innovation. And so with, with that, I'd like to hand over to Jorgen Vogheli, um, who is the Director of Sustainable Development at the World Bank Group and co-chair of 2030 Water Resources Group. Jorgen. Thank you so much, Jane, first of all, for brilliantly moderating what I thought was a fascinating conversation in the last 90 minutes. Thank you for that. Um, you know, it's certainly to all of us in this space, it's clear that water is absolutely central for our ability to deal with climate change, for environment, for the resilience agenda. It's vital to protect the natural capital, the human capital, the economic capital. It permeates everything we do and it affects all of the businesses that we heard today government and civil society. Uh, as Mari pointed out and several others have mentioned, water has come a little bit more into the forefront as a result of COVID-19. So there is an opportunity. It's clear, I think there's a lot of awareness around the world right now that water is absolutely essential for everything we do. We understand the challenges. What we're not seeing enough of is action. Uh, it makes it consistently into the top five risks in the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report. So it's out there, but we're not doing enough. So, you know, for us at the World Bank, we have a very strong commitment to a water secure world for all. And we are really delighted to host this 2030 water resource group because it's a platform for collective action. It focuses on the SDGs, but more importantly, it's really inclusive. It really brings everyone in this space together. You've heard today from big companies like AB InBev, uh, Bitco and others, how they are prioritizing water, how they are giving their limit, their time, their resources, their energy to a multi-stakeholder collaboration through this group. And as Tony said, you know, you compete in many ways, but this is a pre-competitive space and none of individual actors can really change uh, the way we deal with water. So it can only be done in multi-stakeholder collaborations like this one. So we at the World Bank are very, very strongly supportive of this. This one is uniquely positioned because it's not just a pilot or an experiment. It's been around for more than a decade, and it has established itself as a disruptive catalyst in the water resources sector because it's strategically engaging with over 800 partners. It's driving this design and implementation chain mentioned some of them uh, of some policies. 
program projects, financing instruments. It goes through innovation across all these different areas where innovation matters. It's not just technical information. It's not just institutional information, um, uh, innovation. Uh, it's, it's, it's the holistic approach that this group takes. And it's taken it from an initial thought, you know, experiment, if you wish, into something very practical on the ground. I think you've heard a lot of these good examples from India, from Bangladesh, from Peru today, and there's more out there. So we only have a couple of minutes left, so I will not uh, mention more of the um, achievements of this group. But for us, they're truly fascinating. There have been a lot of firsts, right? A lot of creativity, a lot of innovation in there. You know, I've been in, in this space also for several decades, and I can say without a doubt that supply, supply chain issues are really tough, and they become tougher because of climate change, and water is an essential part for multiple stakeholders when it comes to, to assuring their supply chain. This cuts across agriculture, energy, the food system, mining. Um, so this is not something unique to a comp an individual company. It's, it's for everybody. So we heard today from all the participants how much they value this ability to actually get together, to drive deeper into the topic to really have an ability to influence policy, but to also demonstrate, um, and I think there was a, a really brilliant way of, of saying to somebody earlier, we need to move from doing good individually and in, in, in certain elements to being good collectively. I, I, I thought that, that, was a, that was a brilliant line. So from our perspective, rest assured uh, that the World Bank will stay the course on this. We believe this is impactful, this is action oriented, it goes beyond uh, conversation. We, this, we don't see this group simply in convening folks to have a talk. We see this group convening you know, individuals, groups, politicians, civil society actors, farmers to make a difference, to move it from concept to something very practical on the ground. And I think we've seen some really good um, examples here today. So we hope and I hope that those of you who have listened today, more than 120 folks were on the line, <clears throat> that you that you come from the fan that you that you that you engage that you that you come in become a part of it support it, it bring your energy your your innovation your creativity to the table uh, so that's that would be my plea uh, from here let me now hand it over to um, Paul Bricky who is the chairman of Nestle and of course has been an incredible driving force over the last decade in bringing key actors and key players. To the table. Over to you, Paul. It's my great pleasure co-chairing this WRG 2030 Resources Group with you. Over to you, Paul. Oh, we can't hear you. You're still muted, I believe. Do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks, oh, Paul. Sorry for that. Uh, thank you, Jürgen. Uh, also, thank you for the World Bank hosting us, but also for your leadership and uh, from the World Bank's leadership in driving this uh, innovative and disruptive uh, partnership called the Water Resource Group, the 2030 Water Resource Group. It is, as you have heard, uh, the Water Resource Group is a proven entity for stakeholders to develop a shared vision for change and most importantly, to deliver action and on that vision. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and the Water Resource Group is just about that. It's about a dialogue, yes, but primarily about doing things, uh, action where it matters. And uh, indeed, uh, we, we, we have a clear vision and, uh, and together with you and uh, understanding your enthusiasm and feeling it, uh, all, of, all of you and you, Jürgen, uh, it is to, we want to amplify this. Uh, so we have, uh, we, we, first of all, we want to go deeper, it means leveraging uh, uh, the expertise of all of you, the World Bank's investment and expertise for greater impact um, in the countries we are in, expanding it, our presence from national to regional, state level, and to city level. First, also growing bigger and expanding. We are in 14 countries. You want to go to 25 countries and states and scaling our impact on the regional level. So growing bigger and then innovating faster, which is shaping the global agenda on really value chain, the redesign and transformation into a circular economy. It uh, means also sy systematic resilience, keeping these projects running. This is actually a, a call to action. Uh, we need progressive partners to join us. We want more perspectives also from different angles still. We we are working on giving also the financial angle to, to the water resource group, etc. Because water is important. You have mentioned that, Jürgen. Water is life. 
and it matters. And there is a lot of pressure on water. So something has to be done. And before closing, because I think I'm repeating quite a few of these phrases that have been said, but before closing, I want to acknowledge the contributions and commitments of all our existing global partners already, private sector, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, AB, MBEF, and most recently now Unilever, governments, Hungary, Switzerland, Israel, international organizations, you, the World Bank, International Finance Corporation, International American Development Bank, African Development Bank, and other international organizations like United Nations Development Program, Global Green Grove Institute, International Union for Conservat Conservation of Nature, Global Water Partnerships, etc. And I want to you, uh, thank you, Jane, um, Jane Nelson, uh, for first of all, excellent uh, management of tough time schedule, but also you have been part of this. You have been articulating, phrasing uh, the, what we do. And I remember the study you made in, in the context of Harvard, but it was one of the best pieces that really had pointed down what really makes the water results work, which is first systematic, measurable, but also having the ownership of the concrete projects in the hands of local authority. That is what creates resilience. You have formulated so well. Thank you for, uh, for having been part of this conversation, managing it actually. Thank you again. To all speakers for sharing from the heart. I felt the, the enthusiasm of everybody who has spoken. I can't thank them enough for their dedication to multi-stakeholder collaboration, putting their time and energy to break silos, test innovation, and willing to fail also and to tackle tough policy challenges, thereby creating the, uh, the upstream condition for better water management and overall governance. And I want to thank Karen and her whole team again uh, for this, this, well, I would say convincingly stubbornness of what really m works. And this is one of the few multi-stakeholder platforms that I know that is really working well. It's action with results, and that's why we want to uh, scale up. Uh, I want to thank all of you who have been part of this session today. Uh, it has been rich, apparently. Sorry, I came a little bit late, but still, it has been rich for what I felt. And together with you, if you allow me, Jürgen, uh, my fellow co-chair, uh, uh, and who shares the same passion uh, uh, from the Conference Council, I look forward for the engagement with the 2030 Water Resource Group to accelerate the impact towards uh, the, the Sustainable Development Goals. Jürgen, you came in uh, and you say, look, that looks fine. I, I understand, I feel, I'm enthused, I believe, and we have to scale up. And I'm so happy to feel the same um, from all these partners, but also from your leadership of inspiring us. So with that, I, well, just thank you. It's so motivation, and it's so motivating, and we're just starting to write a new chapter. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much all. Thank you, Paul. Thank Super. you, Jürgen. Thank you, Nelson. Uh, Jane, oh, good to see you. Lovely, lovely to see you all. And thank you again, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Well, have a nice day and thank you for being part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you.